I believe that everyone on this planet is innovatively perfect. I believe that how innovative we are isn't necessarily because of the systems or technology we have in our lives, but because of our mindset. I believe that our mindset is a personal choice that we can make every moment of our lives. And I believe that the behaviors that we practice in our innovative fitness program will determine how many moments we'll spend in that mindset each day. And most importantly, I believe that we, the educated, the wealthy, the blessed, have an obligation to live in that mindset as often as we can to help those who are not so blessed. And I believe living in that mindset is sometimes uncomfortable. <laughs> Especially after lunch. Very uncomfortable. I apologize for showing you that, and I apologize even more for what I'm about to show you. In 2003, the Minnesota Timberwolves National Basketball Association professional basketball team in my hometown of Minneapolis, Minnesota, otherwise known as the absolute worst basketball team in the National Basketball Association, asked me to ideate, innovate, and execute an idea that would somehow engage their customers a bit more at the game. The reason they did this is because the game itself was so unengaging. So we went through the normal process. We brainstormed, we went through a funnel process with lots of ideas that were unchallenged at the beginning and then edited and finally made their way through a vetting process to find the idea that worked best to engage their audience. Unfortunately for me and my family, that idea was for me to dance in front of 18,000 people with my shirt off. <laughs> and then to have one of the actors from our comedy theater come and arrest me as a cop and take me out of the stadium. It worked. They thought that was engaged. We came back eight times that year. I even danced with the dance line girls, which made me question the moral fiber of the community that I lived in. <laughs> and I thought we were done. I was 39. Our first son was only a year and a half, so he wouldn't remember that his father had done such a thing. But then, this February, I got a text from the president of the Minnesota Timberwolves letting me know that Kevin Garnett, the best player who ever played for our team, was coming back to the team, and he was wondering if Jiggly Boy was coming back. <laughs> I'm a professional comedian, and if there's anything I know, it's about how to work an audience, and I realized that me at 39, being arrested perhaps is funny, but me at 49, dancing with my shirt off, is just simply obscene. And the goal was to engage the audience, not to have them vomit in their mouths. <laughs> but we negotiated and I brokered a deal that my sons could be involved. And mostly it was because I knew that what we would do would ultimately bring some joy to people. Ridiculous, silly joy, but some joy. So this is what we did. <laughs> we can bring up the sound if you can, guys. So that was 10 years ago. It worked. We were on the Today Show. It was before Viral came about. All right, Pat, this is this year. That's going. Kevin Garnett. It's time for you to show us your moves. In the first half of Let's the game, moves. we showed what the old got? video so people would remember that day nine and a half, ten years ago. And then we worked our comedic rule of three. First, we showed them us. That's my son William on the left. I don't know the child in back of me, but he's clearly ill-medicated, and his family needs to get some good therapy. That was the first beat in the comedic Can we scene. Go back? Wait a second. Can we go back? Here comes the second beat. There's our other son, Michael Xavier. This one was, oh, come on, folks, I'm a little too old for this, but my sons might want to play. Now we build some anticipation again. So in the rule of three, you work on the rhythms of your audience. Beat, beat, pause, punchline. So we pause a bit and we come back for the punchline. 
But before any good punchline, you have to have change. More try. We use change as a way to prepare them to laugh. And in this case, the change is Usher. a salute. So there's the MVP of the league. Back at you, Kevin. So I improvised with him to keep his attention because I knew now we had something that perhaps could go viral. And that's when he decided to say, that's one crazy mother. There it is. Thank you. I'm the youngest of eight from an Irish Catholic dairy farming family in Wisconsin. And every time I see that video, I think of my mother and I'm wondering if I really should say thank you or not. <laughs> but I know she feels that the $150,000 she spent on my education really, really <laughs> was worth it. <laughs> Yesterday we went and had our PR firm check to validate that that has had more than 100 million views in our world since February, which once again makes me question where we are as a civilization. <laughs> Today we're gonna to talk about the mindset of innovation, not about dancing with your shirt off. And at the end of our presentation today, we'll talk about how perhaps the mindset of innovation, both in that minute-long interaction with Kevin Garnett, but most importantly in the 48 hours afterwards, were used to help some people. And that's what the goal of my presentation is today, to inspire you to use the mindset of discovery help people. We declare as improvisers in the first five to ten seconds of the scene to let our teammates and our audience know who we are, where we are, and what we're trying to accomplish. So my declaration for today, first gratitude. To be here is an unbelievable honor. I am in this country for 23 days with my beautiful wife and our two sons. I pinch myself. I can't believe that from the dairy farm through corporate real estate to owning a the theater somehow got us to your wonderful country. I'm grateful to be here. I don't have anything to tell you today. I'd like to share some things about our art form and share some things that I've learned from our clients that I hope serves you. And I have a lot of energy. I was really, really hard for me to be in the wings while she was out here dancing because I really <laughs> wanted to get going. <laughs> Although I don't think I can pull off the leopard string tights. Uh, <laughs> that, that would have just been bad. But you'll know that as sometimes trite as we treat energy as a soft skill, for an improviser, it's an ingredient to innovation. The level of our energy has to do with the level of our innovation. So I will give you all the energy that I have. That's our theater. It's in downtown Minneapolis. If you've seen the show Saturday Night Live on TV, that show was based on this theater. Since May 10th of 1958, we have been pissing off Minnesotans by doing political and social satire and improvisation and we have not missed a weekend since May 10th of 1958, and as long as I'm alive, we won't miss another one. We have about 50,000 guests, and the gift that we give them is laughter and a two-hour respite from their lives. My wife runs our school. Most of our students are adults like yourself who work at Best Buy or Target or 3M or General Mills or Medtronic or the other corporations in Minneapolis, and they take our classes not to learn how to improvise as performers, but to learn how to improvise to change their lives and be more innovative. I spend my life funding that theater. <laughs> and we do that simply by fooling large corporations to pay me to speak. And, <laughs> and so far the suckers are buying it, so. <laughs> we look at our behavior sometimes and we look at it in a, a, a large way and we kind of break it down and you've seen this many times before. What tools do we use for innovation? Very important. What specific skills, whether it's brainstorming or, or uh, design thinking or modeling or all those things, those are all very important. Where we live, in the world of improvisation is in the mindset, and it's for a very practical reason. We really don't have any tools or specific skills that we can access with any reliability or predictability. Because what we do is we sit in front of an audience, I think there's probably about six or 800 of you today here. Uh, our our um, theater holds 204 seats, so a real small little intimate theater. And we ask those people for a suggestion of what they'd like to see us do an improv scene about. And unlike you or most innovative customers, they're really drunk, <laughs> really drunk. And we ensure that they're really drunk for two reasons. It's the highest margin profit we have in our entire organization. <laughs> and as it says on our beer glasses, the drunker they are, the funnier we seem. 
on that stage, after we hear what our customers need, we have to develop role, we have to develop strategy, we have to ideate, we have to refine, and we have to bring to market in a matter of three minutes while they're watching. And to do that, we don't have any of the things a traditional theater would say they needed to produce a product. What I mean by that, if you asked a traditional theater, what would you need to create a piece of theater, they might say a script, a director, rehearsals, props, and costumes. But 234 nights per year, for 58 years, we've been producing theater without any of those. So the model that we've developed after taking improvisational mindsets to the corporate world and then listening to our clients for 15 years is pretty simple. It says that on any given moment, we could be in a mindset of fear or a mindset of discovery. Those are words that we just chose. Those are the words that we've kind of heard the most. And that we can determine where we are in that mindset and how often we're in either of those by the behaviors that we practiced. And how often we practice and how well we practice those behaviors, our innovative fitness plan will directly determine how many moments during the day we spend in either mindset. And so we advocate practicing these five simple things. But we practice them a little bit more intense. We don't listen just with our ears or our eyes or just our bodies. We listen with our hearts. We listen with our instincts. We listen with every single device we have to absorb information, all types of information. We defer judgment. It's not that we're not judgmental. We defer judgment. We simply put space in between what comes to us and when we'll start to judge it. Because we haven't figured out a way for humans not to judge, especially when we have to evaluate, refine, and bring to market and have profitability be one of the metrics that we use for judgment. We, re we reframe things. Since it's unpredictable what is next in our lives, we just decide that whatever comes our way, we will reframe into positive and useful, and then we will have a, prop a propensity towards action. We get what we get, we turn it into something good, and we use it to build. We declare, as I did at the beginning of this, to let people know who we are and what our gut says and what we want to get done. And then we are not hesitant at all. We don't have time. No one will come and pay $27 to see people be hesitant on stage. And we know that the only way we can get better at that is to practice. I'd like eight people to join me on stage. You can come through those doors that say exit, and we'll clap until we get eight people to stand up. We need to do this very, very quickly because I have seven minutes and 26 seconds left. So eight people will clap. Come on up through those doors. One, two, three, four. We need at least eight. Awesome. They'll keep coming and I'll keep, I'll keep talking. When we practice, we practice in a very specific way. Welcome everyone, I'll be with you in just a couple seconds. We wanna make sure that we're humble enough that when we practice, we know we can change. We can get better no matter our age or how good we are at things. We wanna get comfortable being uncomfortable because last time I checked out, if you're doing something new, it will be awkward. And so instead of avoiding discomfort, what if we worked on the athletic skill of being comfortable being uncomfortable? And then how do we do that? We trick ourselves to be of service to others. We will be uncomfortable for their sake. So we practice those five things. Let's practice the art of declaring. If you could come and make a straight line right here and face the audience. This is a simple exercise that we use. We have over 100 in our theater. We use them every day. Our finance staff uses them, our marketing staff uses them, I use them, our actors use them, our janitor uses them because we wanna live in the mindset all day long. What's gonna happen is we're gonna practice communicating. I'm gonna choose you and you and I are gonna clap at the same time and clap. You'll make eye contact with just once. Sorry, we'll clap just once, ready? And then you'll choose someone and clap with them. And then you'll choose someone and clap with them. And you'll choose someone. There we go, we'll clap together. Good job, awesome. Good job, and you'll clap with someone. There we go. Good, good. There we go. Awesome. Give them a round of applause. Simple exercise, right? For 15 years, we've been doing this exercise in front of audience, and I can just tell you folks, I can read their mind. Here's what they're thinking. Boy, those people suck at that. It seems pretty easy to do. What the hell's wrong with them? Are they all drunk? Come on up and try it. It's a simple communication model, a sender and receiver of information and time and distance in between, and yet, we sent messages before the receiver was ready. We sent our message and then we checked out. We were in a group communication and we decided that we wouldn't listen at the top of our ability. Why? 
because we got a lot of other stuff going on, like, oh my God, I didn't know there was a fourth tier up here, right? Or whatever they're all thinking. We're all thinking this. So let's work on the system, the behavior, and then the mindset. System first. Let's make a big circle right here. Now we'll play the same game, and when you choose to clap with someone, it's a lot clearer. Because if I'm going to clap with you, you probably won't think I'm clapping with you. Here we go. Good. Good. Awesome. Really good. Perfect. Wonderful. Nice. Great. Wonderful. Great. Good. Awesome. Great. Another round of applause. That's the system. You can stay there. Now some behaviors. We'll get our hands here. It'll just increase a better response. It'll keep us alert. We won't send until we've made eye contact, made a connection with a human being, and gained their permission. Okay? We'll try to clap well first, and then we'll try to clap fast. And then here's the mind shift. Our goal is to prepare the receiver and to care for them. We are now of service to each other. Okay? Here we go. Good, awesome, nice, perfect, wonderful, way to go, great job, really good, awesome, nice, perfect, great. Give him a round of applause. Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. A simple, easy game that you could start your next meeting with. You can even play it on a video call. You can do simple things that will start things in a way that says, let's get into the right mindset before we begin. And this practice is the thing I think is most missing in the business world. I played very competitive American football. Then I spent nine years in corporate real estate, and for the last 18 years I've been in the world of the arts. In athletics and in art, we spend the majority of our lives practicing. If you come to our theater tonight, they'll be warming up their voices for a half hour, their bodies for a half hour, their minds for a half hour, before they start rehearsal for our scripted holiday show, which doesn't open until November 16th. Practice, practice, practice. But in our world, we wake up, we drink coffee, we execute, we meet our numbers, we hit the quarter, we hit the year. Ah! Then we have a nervous breakdown, then we get our resume together, and then we shift gears to another job. <laughs> or practice. It's uncomfortable to do this on a daily basis. Life shows up. But when we live in the mindset of discovery and we try to serve the rest of the planet, sometimes silly things can turn into big things. Please go to this website. <laughs> Within 48 hours of that video going live, we realized we had something in our hands because we were at a million hits in the first 12 hours. I realized that what we had done is brought some joy to people because of our silliness. Someone showed me a set of still f photographs of that night, and everyone in the audience around me was smiling. And that made me feel good. And then I realized, without trying to, that we even, in this privileged world we live in, take our smiles for granted. Because there are many who cannot smile. And there's an organization in Minneapolis, Minnesota called the Smile Network International. And what they do, for $500 per child in third world countries, is do cleft palate surgeries. It takes 45 minutes, the stitches are on the inside, and that afternoon, that child's life is different. These children are thought to be demonized. No schooling, no kissing, no friends. It's hard for them to eat when they're young. And so we created this website, and you can go there, and you can watch the silly video, and you can also just simply click and give a dollar to Smile Network. And if you do, you can help people like Sergio.
Over 100 million people have watched that video. We've done more than 100 surgeries already because of that website. If everyone in this room goes to the website and gives a dollar, another child will have a surgery. So today all we wanted to do is to share the mindset of discovery that came from the world of improvisation. We use it to perform, but we also use it to live a life in the mindset of discovery to allow us to help as many people as we can on any given day. Bless you all. Mm -hmm.